Well, we've come to the last lesson in this series of uh, teaching on the fundamentalist modernist controversy. And we're really going to track the trajectory from the 1930s until today, more or less, um, and kind of get the rest of the story. And then we're going to kind of close with some uh, some thoughts on fundamentalism and uh, our perspective as Christians today, as Bible, believe in, Bible believers um, contending for the faith. So I'm going to jump right into this, uh, and we're going to begin, number one, with the fundamentalist legacy since 1930. The fundamentalist legacy since 1930. So the, the main battle we've talked about was mainly between 1920 to 1930, that decade of bitter conflict in which the end of it was the major denominations went liberal, and the conservatives, in essence, were, I don't know if I'd say kicked out, but they left. They departed, started their own organizations, started their own schools, started their own um, networks and fellowships and all of that. So what happened afterwards? Where, what happened with the fundamentalists post-1930? Well, let's talk about it a little bit and get to know uh, a little bit about what happened. Uh, letter A there is they embraced separatism. This group, they were forced into separatism, right? In a way. I mean, originally, the fundamentalists were not interested in leaving their denominations, uh, mostly. They tended to be more, let's get the liberals out and save our denominations. That was their original thought. And then once the balance of power tipped in favor of liberalism, then the conservatives or the fundamentalists started thinking, okay, maybe if this is the way our denomination is going, we can't be a part of that. So initially they were kind of forced into it. They, they had no other alternative. It was either stay with this corrupt theology or depart and begin again. And they chose the latter in faithfulness to scripture. And uh, there are places we can point to in the Bible where we are told to separate from false teaching, separate from false teachers and uh, wickedness and, and false doctrine. And so they were being obedient to those scriptures. However, following 1930, they not only um, practiced separation, they embraced it. And it became kind of one of the core principles of fundamentalism is if, well, what started off with, we're separating from liberalism, false doctrine, false teaching. And, and I think all of us would say, yeah, that's necessary. But within a decade or so, it became clear some of the fundamentalists really took the whole idea of separation to new levels, where it was, if you don't agree with my particular set of values or my particular perspective on fundamentalism, well, then you're not fundamental enough. And they begin to separate from one another. Um, and this happened, I could, there are specific examples, but let me just speak generally about it. Um, these personalities, especially the leaders of the fundamentalist movement, we talked about like T.T. Shields and um, J. Frank Norris and some of these guys who were big, loud, um, very vocal proponents of fundamentalism. They also had very strong personalities. And so a lot of them didn't get along personally because they were, they had their own, you know, they had their own radio program. They had their own uh, base of support. They had their own networks. And so a lot of them <coughs> kind of gave one another the cold shoulder because, hey, you're not part of my group. And you know, we could be harsh on them about it. Uh, like I said, we understand that separation is important, but you start getting into separating and separating and separating, it's like, okay, where does this end? Eventually, you're going to end up an island on your, by yourself, right? Because nobody is as doctrinally pure as me. Because everybody else, if they disagree with me at any point, well, they're wrong and we got to separate. Um, letter B, though, fundamentalists also renounced worldliness. Again, that's something we would say, yes, necessary. Uh, the Bible talks about us uh, you know, exposing the, the deeds of darkness and you know, have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, 
So yeah, we should renounce and steer clear of worldliness, those sins. But, and we even saw this during the 1920s, the fundamentalist kind of, well, they got very specific on what constituted worldliness. So they were against all kinds of, the, for instance, during the 1920s, a lot of fundamentalists were behind the um, prohibition and the uh, you know, against alcohol. No, I mean, I'm not saying that that's a wrong. I, I mean, I think you could probably make a pretty strong case that alcohol is harmful to society. I mean, just look at all the alcoholics and all the drunk drivers and all the deaths that have occurred because of that. I mean, you can make a strong case for it. But look what the fundamentals did. They, they started taking specific areas of what they identified as worldliness and went after them. For instance, you know, dancing, um, you know, I think they called it co-ed bathing, but it was basically men and women swimming together. Once again, everybody's wearing bathing suits. It's not like it's anything today wouldn't be uh, anything controversial. But at the time, you know, mixed bathing, that was, uh, that was one of the things. But on and on it goes. For instance, the, the college I went to would probably be considered a fundamentalist school. They would probably even call themselves that. And on the rule books, now, you know, it, it was changing. Even when I was there, the rules were beginning to change. But, I mean, they had rules on the books that were like, you know, you can't play with playing cards. Yeah. And you can't, you can't visit the movie theater. You can't. I think they had a rule at one time. You couldn't, uh, you know, go roller skating. But you see what's happening is, is fundamentalism becomes about critiquing yeah. all these cultural things. Um, so, again, renouncing worldliness is, a, is what the church ought to do. And yet, you can see how the, the trajectory, it starts well, and then it kind of turns into uh, just nitpicking at lots of things that eventually, uh, as you look back, it's kind of like, wh why was that an issue? Why was that such a big deal? So letter C is uh, key fundamentalist figures. Uh, so in post-1930, we've already talked about the guys that were before, but post-1930, a lot of these men are have a radio presence, and they're evangelists. Those are the two kind of factors. So number one there is Bob Jones Sr. You've probably heard of him before. Um, pre preacher in the South. Um, he actually is fairly early on. He's probably the oldest of these fellows. By the time uh, he dies in 1960-something, 64, I think. Um, so he's sort of like the, the old saint of... Fundamentalist revival. Um, so he actually starts off, you know, preaching and, and traveling all over the South, mainly in the South, uh, preaching to huge crowds. Well, in 1925, a uh, young Bob Jones Sr. is having a conversation with William Jennings Bryan, as I understand it. And William Jennings Bryan, of course, was on his crusade against evolution right up to his death, right after the Scopes trial. And basically, he made the comment to Bob Jones Sr., you know, if we don't start educating, if we keep sending our kids off to these schools, they're all going to learn evolution and our country is going to go down in a hole. And so that's kind of sprung the idea of, hey, I should start a fundamentalist college. And originally Bob Jones College, which became the university, was started in Florida and it, it kind of uh, didn't get settled for a little while until eventually it landed in Greenville, South Carolina, where Bob Jones senior became the first president uh, he was on the board but eventually it was passed on on to bob jones senior uh, on bob jones jr um, he had a, he did have a radio program i think um but very well known uh in fact some people say that uh let's see it was next to somebody uh perhaps perhaps dl moody but he was already fading out though he was he was gone by the end of the 1800s uh, but Bob Jones senior was one of the most well-known evangelists in America in his generation um, I read somewhere that he preached to over 15 million people during his lifetime um, so that's that's pretty incredible and of course his legacy is Bob Jones University I mean that's that's kind of what he left behind uh, the second personality or figure we should just take note of is John R. Rice. Oh, that's a 
Yeah. Yeah, John R. Rice. Um, all right, so the next two guys we talk about, again, both evangelists, both have a radio <laughs> presence. Um, John R. Rice is sort of the... This will be surprising if you know anything about him. He's the softer and gentler uh, fundamentalist. You might say, John R. Rice, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, isn't he a, one of the fighting fundamentalists? Well, yeah, but compared to the next guy, he's, he's a little on the nicer side, I guess. Um, most, most of his ministry down in Texas, uh, he eventually ends up in near Wheaton, uh, where he produces, this is the main thing, and we'll talk about it more in a second, is he produces the Sword of the Lord, which is publication, it's fundamentals publication, uh, puts out articles, and, and his real passion was soul winning. That's what he was all about, was let's go out and win souls. So John R. Rice. In fact, our old um, Soul Stirring Hymn book, you know, the, the blue one that we used to have, that was a Sword of the Lord publication. Yeah. So uh, it was very influential, and, and, you know, it's still going on. In fact, a couple of weeks ago was the Sword of the Lord. They had a virtual convention or a virtual meeting because of, you know, the virus. So it's, it's alive. Um, of course, John R. Rice has been gone for a long time, but uh, one interesting thing about him is he's not really caught up, as far as I know, uh, in any controversies or, um, well, I mean, he's caught up in controversies because stuff we'll talk about in a few moments, but he, in other words, he's, there's no personal scandals. So he comes out as a pretty, uh, with a decent reputation. Um, of course, anybody who doesn't like fundamentalists is not going to like John R. Rice, so uh, he won't come out unscathed on that f front. The last one is Carl McIntyre. McIntyre is a Presbyterian fundamentalist. Uh, most of his life is spent up in New Jersey, where he pastors a church, and he becomes the more militant side of it. Uh, he publishes a, a magazine entitled The Christian... Uh, Oh, what's it called? The Christian, it's not the Christian Courier, but it's something like that. Christian Beacon, that's what it is. Christian Beacon. And it's a magazine, and, it, and basically he uses it more or less to attack people. That's his main, that seems to be his main function. Uh, a lot of times he's attacking liberals and, um, you know, evolutionists and that kind of thing. Okay. But he also uses it to attack other fundamentalists that he doesn't like, um, other people who aren't as well as political things. He's very, he gets very involved politically. Um, McIntyre lives until 2002. So, I mean, he's, he starts the Christian Beacon in 1936. And he lives all the way to 2002. So, I mean, he was, he was publishing articles about the Vietnam War, um, outspoken on a number of different political fronts, and made a lot of enemies. Because a lot of people he started off friends with, like Francis Schaeffer and others, who uh, he ended up writing articles against them later on because some stance that they took he didn't like or some something about it. So he's very uh, controversial. Like He, he kind of stirs things up. Um, he, he's even writing articles against, uh, I think, against John R. Rice you know, and some of the others in, in his Christian Beacon. Um, but he's, he's more, he stays within the Presbyterian world, though. He's part of that Bible Presbyterian offshoot of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. All right, so those are some of the figures. Uh, I'm going to go quick through this next part, letter D, the key fundamentalist institutions, because these are all ones connected with the people we just talked about. The first is the ACCC. ACCC. Three C's. Yeah, which is the American um, Council of Christian Churches. It was kind of like a comeback to what was the, uh, I think it was called the National Council of, of Churches. Eventually, there's going to be a World Council of Churches, which both of those are ecumenical. They're very, they're very much, you know, let's bring everybody together. Let's forget our differences and try and work alongside of one another. Well, Carl McIntyre starts the American Council of Christian Churches, and it's kind of like the fundamentalist... Uh, fundamentalist wing of this, uh, you know, think of the Council of Churches. Well, it's, it's that, but it's fundamentalist. <coughs> um, so that's one organization. Uh, number two is Bob Jones University, or you can just put BJU. Obviously, that has a big, uh, a big part in the world of fundamentalism. And then the last, the third, is the Sword of the Lord, which is John R. Rice, his publication.
We could also mention the Christian Beacon. Oh, there's tons of them. In fact, this is just a small little sampling. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of fundamentalist preachers from 1930 all the way till right now who have written, you know, new newspapers and articles and uh, you know newsletters. They've produced radio programs, and now, of course, they're producing websites and YouTube channels and um, tracts and booklets and books, you name it. Um, so there's this whole... And the thing is, within fundamentalism, you can be a fundamentalist and be totally independent. So it's not like there's an organizational structure, like, okay, we're the fundamentalists and, and everybody's got to be within this orb. No, it's you've got you know, Back Creek Baptist Church, which is fundamentalist, and, you know, they could be writing tracks and booklets and all this kind of stuff. They're not connected to anybody else, but they're still part of the sort of fundamentalist, fluid fundamentalist movement. Um, so that's why I say there's hundreds and thousands. I mean, we could, we could never name them all because there's just too many to name. But these are some important ones. I mean, obviously, if, you, if you're ever in a fundamentalist circle, there's generally going to be at least a knowledge of Bob Jones. Although there are some fundamentalists that don't think Bob Jones is quite fundamental enough, you know. But there you have it. All right, so number two, are, are any questions so far on the fundamentalist legacy since 1930? We're not finished talking about the fundamentalists yet, but that gives you an idea in the years following. All right, then the next one, number two, is the rise of you can put either new or neo. So neo-evangelicals or neo just means new. So the new evangelicals, as they're called. Or new evangelicalism. So I give you a little flow chart here. Let's follow this together. Um, if you want to write, you see the fundamentalists at the top of the flow chart. Um, if you want to write 1930 up there with it. Um, so in 1930, you had two options. You could be a fundamentalist or you could be a liberal, pretty much. And... If you, if you use the word evangelical, well, you were talking about fundamentalists. They were one and the same. So fundamentalist, evangelical, whatever. It's the same, same difference. Well, after 1930, there's kind of a, a slow separation that happens between fundamentalism and what's called evangelicalism. So fundamentalists tend to be the, the militant, let's separate, whereas evangelicals are sort of the they believe the same things, for the most part. You know, they believe the Bible is the word of God, and they believe in inspiration and inerrancy. They believe in the virgin birth, all that stuff. But evangelicals tended to be less harsh in their denunciation of worldliness, less harsh in their uh, denunciation of liberalism, and so on. So you had sort of the, the more outspoken fundamentalist and the more moderate, I guess you could say, evangelicals. So that's already starting to split. Out of evangelicalism, now fundamentalists pretty much stay like they are. They don't, there's not any development per se. They're just there. Evangelicalism though, however, gives way, you can follow the line down, to neo-evangelicals. So what happens is uh, some people come along and basically say, listen, um, Evangelicalism slash fundamentalism needs to be reformed. Therefore, we need a new evangelicalism, which addresses what they saw as the problems in fundamentalism. So neo-evangelical eventually comes out to um, two groups within it. There's the, fun, the evangelical right and the evangelical left. Uh, so left, I'm talking about, tends to be, I mean, you could actually call them, I guess, liberal evangelicals, which seems like an odd turn of a phrase, but uh, we're definitely seeing this today. This is where we're at. Generally, people tend to, most Christians and most, you know, of the authors and so on tend to be somewhere on the spectrum of evangelical ref, left, evangelical right. Um, and the evangelical right has more in common with the fundamentalists, but most of them would not be willing to call themselves fundamentalists. Does that make sense so far? Well, let's talk about it. So the rise of neo-evangelicalism. Letter A, they believe that fundamentalism needed reform. So they look around and they say, 
And this is about 19, mid-1940s, okay? So what happens? From 1930 to 1940, you've got a decade of fundamentalism sort of building its own institutions, uh, getting on its feet, and then what happens? World War II. So 1941, Pearl Harbor's attacked. Uh, U.S. launches into World War II, and pretty much our whole nation is engaged in the war. Well, when Germany surrenders, and then shortly afterwards, Japan surrenders, there's a big economic boom in, in America. You know, you have all the soldiers coming back from the front, and um, a lot of them are coming into to new jobs, and uh, there was sort of this boom after World War II. And the evangelicals, or excuse me, the fundamentalists, I guess and the evangelicals, um, ride that wave. Because uh, a, lot a lot of the soldiers, in fact, a lot of uh, preachers I've met, uh, many of them are gone now, but would tell you, their, their testimony was, hey, I served in World War II, and when I came back, I went to Moody Bible Institute. When I came back, I went to... Um, you know, whatever, uh, some Bible school, or even a seminary maybe, and became a preacher. Uh, and so with this sort of post-World War II boom, fundamentalism is really rolling along. But some people are not comfortable with it. They feel like it needs reform. Fundamentalism has gotten too, too much on the uh, picking out cultural sins and, and harping on them. They feel like fundamentalism has not done enough on the social activism side, that they've kind of just turned into isolate, isolationism, you know, where they're just holding up in their own little groups and not engaging the culture. Um, they're not happy about the way fundamentalists are separating. They, they feel like they're too, they're too dogmatic on their doctrines you know come on let's have a little grace kind of be be a little more open so letter b they pr they proposed a softer gentler approach they proposed a softer gentler approach so ne neo-evangelicals basically said we need we need to rethink the way we approach culture we approach religion fundamentalism is too mean-spirited and dogmatic we need to be we need to be kinder and gentler. So they formed uh, its own, so neo-evangelicalism formed its own strategy forward. They kind of plotted out, here's what we need to do. Now, let me read to you. This is from 1956, a magazine entitled Christian Life. In it, um, there's a lot of different people that contributed to this, but it basically is laying out, here's what neo-evangelicalism should be, the new evangelicals. And they list off eight points of their new movement. Let's see if you like these. See if these sound like they're, they ring true to you. Number one, a friendly attitude towards science. You know, because fundamentalists are always so gripey about evolution and, you know, science is misleading. You know, and that was the perception. A lot of people, especially after the Scopes trial, well, fundamentalists are anti-science. So we need a friendly attitude towards science. Number two, a reevaluation of the work of the Holy Spirit wonder why they would bring that up. Maybe it's because the evangelicals were trying to, in cabinet, trying to bring in Pentecostals. You know, we need to reevaluate our view of the Holy Spirit because we want, you know, evangelicals should include Pentecostals, it should include you know, all these different brands of Christianity. Uh, number three, a move away from dispensationalism. The, the fundamentals have been teaching dispensationalism for a long time. We need to get away from that. A more tolerant attitude toward varying views of eschatology. So everybody's got a view of end times. We need to be tolerant. We, let's not assume one view and say, this is the way it is, and you got to agree with me. Number five, a renewed emphasis on scholarship. So academics. A renewed emphasis on social responsibility. A re-examination of biblical inspiration. Huh, why do we need to re-examine the inspiration of the Bible? Isn't that pretty much a closed conversation? And then number eight, a willingness to dialogue with liberal theologians. But this is the direction of neo-evangelicalism. Let's, let's re-examine the whole work of the Holy Spirit. Let's reopen the conversation on 
inspiration. Hmm. So here's the steps that started to go forward. Number one is the National Association of Evangelicals, or you can just put NAE. NAE, National Association of Evangelicals, formed in 1942. Today, the National Association of Evangelicals exists, but it's, it, it's pretty liberal, very liberal. I, wouldn't, I would not have membership in, in that organization. But it started as, you know, we need a national organization that, we, that churches can join, individuals can join, denominations can join. And the whole idea was, hey, let's all unify our voice. You know, we're all evangelicals, right? So let's join hands and be part of this. Or, you know, yeah, we've got our differences, but let's set those aside because we're all evangelicals. Um, number two is Fuller Theological Seminary. Fuller Seminary. And if you, if you still got room on that line, you can also write Wheaton College also fits during this. So Fuller Seminary started in 1947, and its whole purpose is it's going to be a neo-evangelical school, a new evangelical school. And the whole thought process behind Fuller Seminary was we want to make a top-notch seminary that's just as good as the liberal seminaries as far as its academics. You know, we're going to put out scholars, not not these fundamentalist preachers, not these, you know, backwoods um, evangelists, but top-notch scholars. Which, okay, but Fuller Seminary, especially based on these eight points of the new movement, um, you can pretty much tell where it's going to go, right? Well, within 20 yeah. years, Fuller is pretty much liberal. Uh, Daniel Fuller, who's the son, Charles Fuller is the evangelist preacher who the seminary is named for. His son, Daniel Fuller, uh, goes off to Princeton Seminary, which at this time is liberal. Then he goes off to Europe to study in a European seminary, uh, gets influenced by liberalism, basically, comes back and then gets a job at Fuller. And uh, during his whole going about, basically decides he doesn't believe in inspiration anymore, at least not like the fundamentalists describe it, and he teaches at Fuller for like 40 years, 50 years almost. Um, well, I guess 40. Anyways, uh, yeah, it's kind of alarming. It, it goes down very quickly. In fact, um, this book here, Battle for the Bible by Harold Lenzel. Um, Lenzel was a, an evangelical, uh, but he was on the evangelical right. And he saw what happened at Fuller, and he, he, wrote, he writes about that and other things in this book, The Battle for the Bible, which our series here is named for. Um, and basically he says, yeah, the, he calls it the strange case of Fuller Seminary, how quickly it just swooped into li liberalism. Um, number three, though, is Christianity Today. Ever hear of it? Christianity Today is a very popular magazine. It goes out, um, again... Probably it's not, it may not be part of our readership because it's generic evangelicalism. Whereas I come from more of the conservative, fundamentalist side of things. Whereas Christianity Today, I mean, you never know what you're going to get. Occasionally there'll be good articles in there, but you never know what you're going to get. There's this, it's as crazy and as wide as you can possibly imagine. Um, and it was started as an opportunity to kind of promote this new evangelicalism. And so Christianity Today, of course, is still very much around. Uh, so on the back side, um, number four is Billy Graham. Now, there's a lot of great things to say about Billy Graham. You know, he preached to more people during the uh, 20th century than any other person that's ever lived, as far as I'm aware. Um, and so his impact is, is big, but he actually gives us a nice little picture of this evangelicalism that's coming along. Because Billy Graham starts off fundamentalist. Um, you know, he's, he, he started off going to Bob Jones University or Bob Jones College before he eventually went down to Florida and studied and uh, bounced around a couple of places. But you know, he was very much considered a fundamentalist preacher. I mean, that's how everybody knew him. Uh, John R. Rice, for a long time, wrote about Billy Graham and the Sword of the Lord and praised his ministry and all that. Well, during the 19, late 1940s and then into the 1950s, Billy Graham 
began to open up a little bit more. So he kind of moved away from the fundamentalist roots more towards the evangelical side of things. To the point that in 1957, he during his New York crusade, he, he teams up with some basically liberals and others. Uh, now, the message Billy Graham preaches is right on. I mean, he preaches like a fundamentalist. In fact, he, he, for the most part, I mean, later on, he makes a few comments about things that you're like, what? Um, but for the most part, Billy Graham's beliefs are that of a fundamentalist, which is what a lot of the evangelicals were. You know, they believed these things, but they, were, they weren't quite as willing to stand on them. They, they were more open. Let, let's have a dialogue. Let's have, uh, let's join organizations where we're more ecumenical rather than separatist. Um, and so Billy Graham becomes kind of a, a lightning rod for some of this because, uh, well, George Marsden, a church historian, said that uh, how you know an evangelical from a fundamentalist is an evangelical is a fundamentalist who likes Billy Graham. You know, because that was sort of the way to tell. Uh, now, again, I like Billy Graham and I appreciate his his preaching and things, but at the same time, I also recognize there was some stuff that he did that I would not have done. Um, and maybe I have a slightly different perspective because I come along way later than John R. Rice and these people who are contemporaries of his. Um, so I think for them, it was some, they felt a little bit of betrayal. And I think that caused them to maybe react a little more viscerally against Billy Graham than maybe I, because like I said, I'm years later, I don't feel the betrayal. I don't feel like, oh, he switched sides on us. Um, but I do appreciate Billy Graham and, and, uh, his ministry, although I don't, like I said, I don't think everything he did was uh, outstanding. Although I will say this, uh, you know, Billy Graham's testimony in his life was was upstanding in the sense that, uh, you know, no financial uh, scandals, no, you know, running around with women scandals. Um, the way he conducted himself really was uh, exemplary. So. So you know the picture here? There's Billy Graham preaching. I think that's like 1950-something. I don't think that's a New York crusade. but uh, So you all know that's Billy Graham, but it points to anybody who knows who the other picture is. Anybody? All right, I didn't, I didn't think so. Um, this is Carl F.H. Henry. So two middle names, Carl F.H. Henry. That's number five, Carl F.H. Henry. And his book, which was kind of the signal call for the evangelicalism, the new evangelicalism. His book, The Uneasy Conscience of the Modern Fundamentalism, 1947. He writes this book, and basically what it is, is he says, he's talking about the uneasy conscience of fundamentalism, and he says, fundamentalists have focused too much on, they haven't done enough to focus on social problems, because... The fundamentalists reacted. You know, there was the social gospel, and they said, no, we're not social gospel. That's that's not who we are. And according to Henry, um, they moved away from all social engagement. They didn't have anything to do with culture. They just sort of moved into their own communities, preached to their own people. They didn't really get involved in solving big national problems, having a voice, you know. Um, and he may be right in terms of his evaluation, but I don't know that he's right in terms of his solution. Because the solution was we need to organize now as evangelicals and get out there and have a voice in culture. And eventually, we're going to see where this leads. In fact, we're going to see right now. Uh, letter D. Right-wing evangelicalism goes political is the last phase of this. I mean... All of evangelicalism does, but particularly right wing. Fast forward from 1950s, you know, when all this controversy about Billy Graham to, you know, 1970s, 1980s. And you have the rise of what's called the uh, religious right, you know, during the Reagan years, especially. Uh, this is people like Jerry Falwell. This is people like um, James Dobson, uh, Pat uh, Robertson. People like that, who become the religious right. 
And, and their idea was is basically they took this idea from Henry, which is we need to be socially engaged to we need to become kind of a voting block. Evangelicals need to have a a political voice, and so they became kind of a a political force that became known as the religious right. And you can read all kinds of stuff about it, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but. Um, in the 80s, and of course, you know, 80s and 90s, it got real big, and then it kind of simmered down because the whole idea was, well, the, the whole thing that was being touted was the evangelicals are the ones that elected Ronald Reagan, you know. So if you can, if you can harness the power of evangelicals, you know, of getting their vote and getting them, that base riled up, well, then you've got a powerful uh, mach political machine. And then the whole thing kind of disintegrated later on um, when you know, a lot of the things they were trying to push ended up kind of backfiring. I remember going even to some things in, with my family in 2008, well, even before 2008, like 2006 and four maybe even, where there was, it was big meetings with some of these kind of members of the evangelical right who were, at that time they were campaigning for, we've got to stop gay marriage and, and same-sex marriage from coming into our land and you know i i was i was right there and i i don't think i'm not apologizing for that i'm saying that that was part of what was going that was sort of uh i don't know if that was the last gasp of the evangelical right so-called but uh and i'm not saying that christians shouldn't be involved in politics either but there was this overemphasis in which uh, kind of the evangelical name became one and the same with a political movement. Um, and that, that kind of flows out of where evangelical was, evangelicalism was headed, was we need to be a force. We need to be out there and social versus the fundamentalists who tended to be more isolated. Um, all right, any questions so far within either fundamentalism or evangelicalism? These are big topics, and we're covering them kind of in survey fashion here, but any questions? Thoughts? All right, well, let's get to number three, which is problems in fundamentalism. This is where I wanted to sort of land on this whole study, because we've been very positive so far. At least I have, right? Have you picked up on that? I've been fairly positive towards fundamentalism. A lot of places you go, nobody has anything good to say about fundamentalists. And I've mostly been saying, they're the ones who stood up for truth. There's the one who fought the liberals. And, uh, you know, good for them. But don't interpret that as, uh, well, I think everything with the title fundamentalist is swell. Um, because the word fundamentalism has sort of, it's been used by a lot of people. So let me get to question number one. Should we embrace the title fundamentalism? Should we go around identifying ourselves and saying, hey, we are fundamentalists? Any thoughts? I mean, do you, do you want people, I mean, is that how you think you should identify yourself? Chance, chances are, chances are you, you probably realize, like a lot of people do, that there's some pretty crazy fundamentalists out there. Uh, yeah. And I'm not sure I want to just go around telling everybody, hey, I'm a fundamentalist without explaining it, because they might think you're with Westboro Baptist Church or something. Um, let me let me depict it like this. Can't the same be said for dispensational, though? Because there's... I mean, the same could be said for any title you get, right? Well, yes. In fact, and the thing is, a lot of people will say, well... Fundamentalism has a bad reputation, you know. It's kind of a slam word, you know what I mean? Like, it was, it, it's almost used to label people in a negative way. But if you think about it, Acts chapter 11, that's how the word Christian was used originally. It was a slam word against those Christ followers in Antioch, who they called Christians. as sort of a derogatory thing, and then it stuck. And eventually it became kind of a badge of honor, you know. Yeah, it's an insult from the world, but... Their insults are, you know, hey, we are Christians. We are followers of Jesus. Uh, I would also argue that, you know, fundamentalist, whether, whether we want to use that term or not, another word that's a slam word, just like fundamentalism, is creationist. Are you a creationist? Well, 
I don't have any problem being identified that way. You know, even if you're meaning as an insult, I'll take it. So let me depict it like this. So 1930, um, you got fundamentalist stuff here. So we'll just put fun. Because everybody knows that fundamentalism is way fun. Um, so these guys back here, what, what was their what was their contention? You know, they were standing on inerrancy. They believed the Bible. They were not, generally speaking, nutty, kind of crazed, you know, what the stereotype of fundamentalist. Okay, so if you follow that trajectory, that line down, that's, that's, we want to stay on that same, I mean, generally, right? Well, evangelicals, on the other hand, kind of drifted, actually, they drift, let's say they drift left. Okay, so here's evangelicalism today. And since fundamentalism, since the 1930s, the groups typically that use the name fundamentalist have drifted towards the right over here. So here's the fundamentalist today. Which leaves, okay, so one group has swung to the left, one group has swung to the right. If you are the so-called theological heirs of the original fundamentalists and you're down here, what do you call yourself? Because if you call yourself a fundamentalist because you say, hey, they were fundamentalists back then and I'm the same thing, well, when you say the word fundamentalist, people are going to think, oh, oh you're over here on the right. But if you use the word evangelical, which was essentially the same thing in 1930, people are going to assume you've swung on this side. So a lot of people have used the term um, conservative evangelical here as a way to sort of say, I'm an evangelical, but I'm not that. Kind of, I'm a conservative evangelical. I'm not a fundamentalist like all the way over here, but kind of in the middle. Again, I'm not sure if that's a great way to do it. Um, I guess it depends on who I'm talking with. You know, if I'm talking with somebody who knows something about history and, you know, it is maybe a member of a church, you know, I can, I wouldn't mind being identified, you know, oh, you're kind of on the fundamentalist side of things, aren't you? Well, depending on how you mean that, yeah, kind of. Um, I'm definitely not sort of this left-leaning, uh, you know, especially the far left of the evangelical spectrum. Um, but if you're, you're talking to somebody who knows, you know, not, not a church person, they don't know anything except for what they've heard on TV news and stuff. If I tell them I'm a fundamentalist, they're going to be like, oh, so you're like one of those crazy snake handling people. Because, you know... Um, Fundamentalist is not just used of Christians anymore. You have fundamentalist Islam. Uh, you have what's the FLDS. You ever heard of that? The fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, which is, those are like the polygamist really Mormons, funny. like the really nutty cult. I mean, Mormonism is a cult, but they're like the, they take cult to a whole new level. Um, and so, yeah, just, it might depend on who you're, who you're talking to, how you want to handle that. But let me get to the second part, letter B. What are the common perils of fundamentalism? Here's, and I, these are totally stream of consciousness, okay? I didn't, I didn't, um, you know, do a lot of consulting. I just kind of wrote down what I thought are some typical, um, typical pitfalls of fundamentalism that, especially in the years following, like, if, if you claim the title fundamentalist, unfortunately, these things have been true to a greater or lesser extent of fundamentalists. Um, the first two, I don't know quite how to how to phrase them, so I'm going to try and do the best I can. Number one, I'm just going to call it ingrown. And so they tend to be very isolated from others, sort of this us for and no more mentality. Uh, but also going along with that, with the whole idea of being ingrown, is number two, nepotism. Nepotism. N-E-P-O-T-I-S-M. So you guys know what nepotism is, right? Where favoritism, especially to family members or, or something like that. Uh, this is true a lot of the time. This is part of that ingrown. You know, you've got preacher Billy, who's the pastor of, you know, Back, Back River Baptist Church again. And, uh, you know, he's preached at Back River Baptist Church for 45 years. And that's his church. You know, he built it from the ground up. And when Brother Billy finally retires or steps off, you know, who's going to take his place but his son, 
you know, Johnny, Pastor Johnny now takes over. And there's a lot of that that goes on where, you know, you have like handed off to a son or handed off to a relative. And it's almost like they're, it's almost like they're building these little kingdoms. They're kings and, and the kingdom passes to the son, you know, instead of, uh, Instead of there being a, a legitimate sort of let's let's think about what's good for our church, it's like oh well we're gonna go with the sun. And I think that I think it's problematic because you know you have this passing of the baton, and it's all you know it, it, favoritism, nepotism never goes anywhere good. But like I said, we're seeing that fallout at Liberty University. Uh, number three is uh, legalism. And this might be one of the, the trademark problems of fundamentalism. Is again, you know, they were fighting against cultural evil. You know, they see sins out of the world. And, but then it turns into this backlash where they become so legalistic in dealing with those sins that you know, we're going to create a list of do's and don'ts. And here's what you, you know, can wear and can't wear. And here's what you can do and can't do. And, um, now again, I'm not I'm not against moral standards, but when you're building this artificial facade of here's what makes you holy, well, you know, you start to get on some dangerous ground because if what you're saying makes a person holy is not what the Bible says makes a person holy, well then you might have an issue. Um and we could probably go around just testimony time and talk about, you know, how, how have you seen legalism in churches? You know, it probably would be eye-opening. So number four is authoritarianism or authoritarian. So the word author, A-U-T-H-O-R-I-T-A-R-I-A-N. Authoritarian. This, unfortunately, is all too true in fundamentalist churches. The pastor is the king. You know, the pastor is in charge. Whoever's the leader has kind of ultimate final say. And if you want to write this underneath or next to it, lack of accountability. That when you have this authoritarian leader structure where you have the the unquestioned leader, uh, this isn't only, by the way, in fundamentalism, but it is true in fundamentalism. Man, it leads to some dangerous, dangerous stuff. Um, you know this author- and unfortunately, it goes back to even early in fundamentalism. Some of those guys were very much authoritarian leaders. You know, they they ran the show, and because of their big personalities and their huge ministries, they really um, had a dangerous amount of power. And number five, it we also got to talk about egotism. So you had a lot of these preachers that were all you know, competing with each other and stuff, these fundamentalists. And this was another hallmark. I didn't actually witness this, but I've heard, you know, there was meetings of fundamentalist pastors and they'd all go around and talk about how big their church was, you know, and talk about how their ministry was growing and how great things were happening, you know. Um, now, I mean, I'm, I don't have a problem with, you know, somebody asked me, hey, how big's your church? But uh, there was this sense in which, hey, we're building our own little empires. You know, we're all building... Our, our little kingdoms that are going to, and we're going to be at the top of it, and we're going to be on the radio, and we're going to be, you know, sort of center of attention. I think it's a problem. Number six is misplaced priorities. I'm thinking mainly of doctrine here. Misplaced priorities that unfortunately plagues um, fundamentalist churches. Let me give you three of them. Letter A, Bible versions. This is the big one, I think, has become more and more a problem with fundamentalists. There's a lot of fundamentalists today are all King James only. You know, that's the only version that you can use. Every other version is evil. Um, that's not what it means to be a fundamentalist. I mean, none of these guys in 1930 were King James only. At least not to my knowledge. There may have been a, a stray one in there. But that's not the essence of fundamentalists. It does not have anything to do with what version of the Bible you use. Um, and yet, some people have made that's that to them is what fundamentalism is, Bible version. Uh, another one is music style. You know, people made a huge, that, and you had the worship wars, you know. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't just in fundamentalism. That was across the board. But you know, some fundamentalists made that the central issue, you know, the big one. 
that we're going to separate from people over what music style they listen to. Uh, now, you know, I think there's, I think there's music that's bad, honestly. You know, I wouldn't want it to be in our church. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's not so much a matter of style as it is, you know, other factors. There's a number of things to consider. Uh, so Bible versions, music style, dress code. Again, you know, the women wearing pants thing. Um, or not wearing pants, I guess. It's like, why did that become a fundamentalist? Like, why did that become some huge deal in fundamentalist churches? You have this elevation of misplaced priorities. You know, they get kind of like single issue voters almost. You know, they get locked into one issue and say that's all that matters. And they'll fight and die on that hill. All right, and then last, I, I have some others I probably could have added here, and maybe maybe as we close, you guys can suggest if there's others that you think should be on this list. But number seven, and this one's the, so ironic to me, is poor biblical exegesis. Exegesis being study of scripture and eventually exposition. I say it's so odd because if you're a fundamentalist, what do you believe? Well, you even if you're on the far right over here, you believe that the Bible is the inspired, perfect word of God delivered from him, his revelation. And yet I've seen so many fundamentalist preachers just absolutely do a terrible job of understanding scripture. And it's like, if you really believe this is the word of God, are you not going to try harder than that? I mean, just to get to the meaning of the text? Because they'll totally misuse it. I had a professor in seminary who... Um, Specifically, he told us this story that he was in a what would be a fundamentalist Bible college, and they had a speaker come into chapel one time. And the speaker was using a verse from like Ezekiel or something that had to do with a vision. And and the verse talked about having a vision, and and he was preaching like this was a great thing. Like, you need to have vision, you need to go out and know what the Lord wants you to do, and you know, get a hold of God's vision for your life and all this. And my professor in seminary said at the time, he was like, something didn't seem right. So he flipped and looked it up. And the passage in Ezekiel is a rebuke to false teachers who have false visions about the future. And, and the Bible is basically saying your visions are, are garbage because you're not following the Lord. And he, he said, here's this guy preaching in chapel, a whole big message on vision that comes from a passage that deliberately refutes the idea of a vision. And like I said, to me, this is sad because it's like, if you believe that the Bible is true, then treat it with respect. I'm not saying take it figuratively. I'm, I'm saying, you know, study it in the historical grammatical way, but make sure you've done justice to studying the Bible. These taking verses out of context and, um, you know, ripping stuff out of the scriptures that has nothing to do and then trying to make it apply to whatever, you know, to condemn whatever cultural sin, you know, you want to prove. For instance, here's another mark on fundamentalist history, unfortunately, is, you know, the, uh, and this one even embroiled uh, Bob Jones for a while, you know, of course, with the interracial dating and, you know, being against intermarriage and, you know, whites and blacks can't date, whites and blacks can't marry, um, you know, was some of that was based on poor study of scripture, honestly. You know, if you look back at the biblical arguments against it, it's like, well, that's not what that's talking about. Um, and so it, that that saddens me almost as much as these others is the fact that they're just, fundamentalism sadly has done a poor job of, of taking the text and being honest with it and presenting it. And again, I'm not saying every fundamentalist church is like that. But it can happen. All these things have been seen in fundamentalist churches. Not everyone. And as I've said before, I feel like I, I kind of grew up seeing, and our church was never deliberately like a fundamentalist church. But, I mean, it, it had some of the hallmarks. I mean, certainly we believe like that. But I feel like I grew up sort of on the good side of fundamentalism. It had all the good things that you would want with not a lot of the bad things. Uh, not a lot of these things, thankfully. But this is what some people think, especially if people have been raised in a you know fundamentalist church that was authoritarian, that was you know big egos and legalistic. You know 
that's uh, what they're going to think. So these are things, this is really a list of things we should avoid. Even if we, even if we choose to say, you know what, I am, I, I'm not afraid of the title. This is, this is who we are. I'm not afraid to be called a fundamentalist. Okay. But don't be these things. Because <laughs> this is what, this is what will kill the soul, kill a church, is, you know, this type of mentality, this type of attitude.